All right, good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Dan Ritchie, president of the Functional Aging Institute. We are at the end of day one. It's Functional Aging Summit 2021, Friday, June 11th. And Guy Andrews from Exercise Etc. is here to do, as you can see, let the games begin. And Guy is also offering another session later today, um, recorded. So if you're on the West Coast, you wanna stick around, you wanna get a Guy double header, feel free. And then Guy is coming back tomorrow uh, again for another session. Um, and that is at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. Um, and that's gonna be Let the Games Begin uh, Olympic Inspired Balance Drills for Seniors. So sort of a part two of today. If you're not familiar with Guy Andrews, uh, he's been in the industry educating folks for over 25 years now. Exercise Etc. has done workshops all across North America and they are going live, he tells us, uh, here in the next few weeks. So if you're looking for a live workshop, uh, he can hook you up. And FAI and Exercise Etc. are teaming up in September, September 17th and 18th. We are hosting our first live event in Denver. So excited you have the opportunity to learn from me and Guy on back-to-back -back days uh, live in Denver. So Guy, thanks so much for your time and your expertise. I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'll be here if you need me. Um, I'll be in the room. I'm just going to turn my video off and try to keep everybody muted. So take it away. And, and as always, we will do questions and answers at the very end of the session. So if you have a question, you might just want to send a chat, but we will cover them at the end. And having said that, welcome. Thank you for being here. It's good to spend some time this afternoon with you. Um, as Dan said, my name is Guy Andrews. I'm the executive director of Exercise Etc. I've actually been in the fitness industry. I passed the 25 year mark a number of years ago. I'm pushing 40 years in the fitness industry. Um, my master's degree is in education. I, like so many of y'all, I've got a variety of different certifications as well. And for the last eight years, I have only worked with older adults. I'm currently a senior fitness specialist with the city of Wilton Manors, Florida. Wilton Manors is a tiny, tiny suburb completely surrounded on all sides by Fort Lauderdale. And um, I'm extremely happy there. Took, like again, like so many of y'all, took off well over a year for COVID. We started back up again in the middle of May and things are going strong. So that's my background, that's my journey. And hopefully as we go through today's curriculum, you'll find some new things to think about, new things that you can do with your, with your folks starting first thing next week. If you would like a copy of today's outline, it is available on the Exercise Center Facebook page. Um, you will see this slide again at the very end of our session today. You do not need to have a Facebook account to um, access the page and get a copy of today's outline, okay? But we'll talk about that again at the end. We are recording this from beautiful Fort Lauderdale, Florida in front of a live studio audience. And I mentioned that because if Federal Express comes, or if the mailman comes, the dog is going to go berserk. Um, I've got the blinds closed. Hopefully they will not knock on the door. But that is my audience. And finally, as I mentioned, I am in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And Fort Lauderdale is very pleased to be the host city next May for the Senior Games, sponsored by Humana. So perhaps we will see some of you guys live and in person in beautiful Fort Lauderdale next May. It looks like pretty much everyone who is going to come is here. So just again, as a reminder, if you will, to please make sure your microphone is muted and your camera is off. And as I mentioned, we will do questions and answers at the very end of our session. For those of you guys who have been with me before, either live or on a webinar, you know that my senior programs tend to have a very, very strong play component. And I've come to realize that, that is not for everyone. The idea of playing and having a playful element to our programs. And then that's fine. Um, I made up my mind long ago when I left the corporate world that I would never again have a job that I did not have fun. And if I can't have fun, and if I can't laugh on a regular basis, I want no part of it. And that's become a central component of all of our fitness programs. But what's interesting is more and more we are seeing research documenting the importance of play and of fun for older adults. You know, the idea of playing, of having fun, 
They are both powerful motivators and they have major benefits. What the research is showing us is that playing, enjoying oneself, actually helps the brain to function more effectively. It might slow down the onset of dementia. It might help memory problems. Because many older adults, I think we have seen this a lot over the last year, when they were so lonely and so isolated, you know, holed up in their homes and apartments, not seeing their friends, their kids, their grandkids. The idea of playing and having a strong play element also has been shown to ward off stress and depression. As you know, enjoying oneself releases endorphins throughout the system, and that helps to relieve stress, which also helps to manage different chronic diseases and illnesses. So the whole idea is that having a strong play component is um, a major, major attribute and a major benefit to any kind of a senior program. It should not be regarded and we don't want our senior clients to regard exercise as a painful obligation. A bunch of the videos that I've taken both for today and tomorrow's webinars, I just filmed this last week, and a couple of the women who had volunteered to help me model for the videos said it was the first time they'd had fun in almost a year and a half. It was the first time they can remember laughing out loud on a regular basis in a year and a half. So the idea of play, having fun, is an important component. Now we're focusing today on sports-inspired balance activities. And really, as Dan mentioned, this is almost a two-part webinar, part one today, part two tomorrow. And why are we focusing now on sports-inspired activities? Mainly because what we're gonna take a look at is familiar to our clients. It's non-threatening to them. You know, I could say to my client, hey, let's do some burpees. And maybe they know what a burpee is, maybe they don't. But if I say, we're gonna play miniature golf. We're gonna play soccer. We're gonna play dodgeball, which I know is politically incorrect, but you'll see how I modify it. Um, it's stuff that they have a frame of reference for. It is less intimidating. It is less threatening. It brings back memories of being young, being in school. You know, if we're playing kickball, if we're playing volleyball or whatever, you know, brings back memories of their youth. It establishes common ground, you know, They'll say, remember when we did this in high school? Remember when we did that in grade school? Or I remember when I was raising my kids or whatever. The nice thing about anything that is sports inspired is they require an integration of strength and cardio and balance, all skills that our senior clients need to remain independent. And in this day and age where many of us are working in non-traditional environments, you know, if we're training in our home, in our client's home, you know, I train in a community center, just a big empty room. Um, they can be done anywhere, inside, outside, and with minimal equipment. So there's some real benefits to using a sport-inspired theme to our balanced programming. So I started my research for this by trying to find out what America's favorite leisure time activities were. And here was one of the lists I found. This was not a promising start for our webinar. Because you take a look at them, these are pretty much all about as passive as you can get, where we don't have to leave the sofa. We can do it with a bag of chips in one hand and a cocktail in the other hand. So I was off to a bad start before I even began, taking a look at America's favorite leisure activities. Although perhaps if we did a webinar around older adults watching TV or watching sports on TV, maybe it would sell, who knows? So then I tried a different search. I said, okay, let's look at America's favorite recreational activities. And uh, things got immeasurably better. So what you can see here from a journal article about a year ago are the 10 favorite activities of Americans with at the very top of the list walking. Strength training, aquatics are on there for those of you guys who are aquatics instructors, all the way down to aerobics and dance and bowling. And we take a look at these 10 activities and pretty much we are covering all of them in the course of today's workshop and tomorrow's workshop. Notifications that will help our senior clients maintain their balance and maintain their independent lifestyle. I'm not gonna belabor this point because I'm sure most of you are already doing this, but whenever I begin a new program or when I begin with a new group of people or I have new people joining my established group, I always begin with a one-legged stand. You know. 
they always have got support nearby for them to hang on to. And the idea is stand on one leg for about 10 seconds or as long as they can. And then the other leg for about 10 seconds. And again, I'm sure most of you guys who are working with seniors are already doing this and you're probably aware of this, but what the research shows us is when clients are unable to stand on each leg without support for about 10 seconds, they are classified as more of a fall risk. When my seniors came back after a 15 month hiatus, I was really concerned because I was sure that I was going to be starting from scratch, that all the benefits that we had achieved over the preceding seven years before COVID knocked us out of commission would be lost. I was only half right. They did lose a lot of their strength, their skill, their balance, but we were not starting at ground zero. And now that I'm in my fourth week of training again, I'm gratified at how quickly their skills are coming back. But I always begin with a one-legged stand just so I know who I'm dealing with, are they a fall risk, and what I'm dealing with. Or, you know, when we take a look at sports-inspired balance drills, we're really going into a new realm or a different realm for some people called functional balance. This is balance that's going to allow people to live independently and actively for as long as possible. You know, for a lot of people, if they're doing a balance class or if they're doing balance training, the be all and the end all of their training is a one-legged stand. And I would never dismiss the importance of doing one-legged stands. You know, that's your base, your base. That's your foundation. But we have got to move on beyond that. Functional balance training goes into training all three of our balance systems not just the muscular or somatosensory system that we use with a one-legged stand, but the visual system. You know, if our vision is impaired, our balance is impaired too. We go into vestibular training, you know, where we're moving the head up and down and side to side to see if we can maintain balance. You know, any kind of changes in the, um, in the posture of the head and the neck is going to throw off the inner ear which is going to throw off balance. That's why many of our drills focus on things like looking up and looking down, moving backwards. So we're not just accelerating, we are decelerating. Many of our sports inspired drills require the older client to do a weight shift, you know, where their head goes up and down, making a level change. A classic example of a weight lift or a level change, a squat, a lunge, a deadlift, a hip hinge, so functional balance training integrates both static balance drills, like we would see with a one-legged stand, with dynamic drills, as you would see in any kind of sports-specific training. So that's our premise that we're going to functional balance training. What virtually all of our older clients want to do is age in place. One of the biggest shocks for me resuming after the pandemic was how many of my older clients are no longer living independently. A good number of them have moved in with their grown kids. Several have gone into assisted living. A couple are actually in skilled nursing as a long-term resident of a nursing home. But what our clients want is to age in place, to stay in their own home with their own stuff for as long as they possibly can. And if our client's goal is independent living and a high goal of function, they have got to be able to maintain their balance while they are carrying things. If they live in a home where there are stairs up and down, they've gotta be able to maintain their balance going up and down stairs. They've gotta be able to pick things up off the floor, to stoop, to stop, to do all the things that go into having a functional independent lifestyle. So our goal in our balance training is to get our clients out of their chair, on their feet, and hopefully keep them out of the nursing home or out of the assisted living. Balance training, of course, begins with developing a base. So core training is after the first part where we start. And some of these sports-inspired drills that we're going to look at today, um, they need to be considered more advanced drills. They're not suitable for every client on day one, their first session. They may need to work up to these drills moving forward. We work on the strength and the mobility of the lower body the toes and the ankles. If they are a fall risk, 
Either maybe they've got a stroke, they've had a stroke. Maybe they've had a bad fall already. We start seated and progress to standing with support. And the task specific drills, the sport specific drills begin after their base, their base conditioning is established. Some of the variations we'll see today are more advanced than others. I don't remember if we're doing volleyball today. I think volleyball is tomorrow, but I'm gonna show variations for chair volleyball, all the way up to standing volleyball with support to regular volleyball like you would see, you know, young people doing on the beach. So we're taking a look at modifications, but we're always erring on the side of the caution. When we are taking a look at sports inspired drills, and I can anticipate the questions that are already coming. I've never played volleyball. I'm not a runner. I'm not a triathlete. How can I do these activities with my older clients and have any degree of credibility? One of the best pieces of advice I ever got back when I was in graduate school was a professor who said, if you show your people, whoever your audience is, if you show your audience what you know, they will never know what you don't know. You know, I would never start, and for whatever, for whatever it's worth, full disclosure, I am not an athlete. I have never been an athlete. I've never been athletic. I've never really been the competitive type. Um, I've never played any kind of organized sports whatsoever. Having said that, I like to think that I'm fit, but you know what I'm talking about, you know, let's do some volleyball training or let's do training for golf. These are not things that by and large I have done in real life. Does that make me a fraud? I would hope not, but I'm going on the premise again that if I show my folks what I know, they will never know what I don't know. So you don't have to be an expert or a participant. If I want to be really cynical, I could say you've just got to know more than your clients do. So design programs that are based on your comfort level and on your experiential level. Use your imagination, pretend, play. I mean, you know, there is not like there is some um, handbook or some rule book governing what we are doing for these kind of programs. Real quick, one of my favorite fitness stories is years ago, back in the late 90s, one of my clients was the booker for one of the major cruise lines down here in South Florida. I don't remember if it was Norwegian or Carnival or, or Royal Caribbean, but she was the one that booked talent. And as part of what she did, she booked exercise professionals to work the cruises. Well, one day she calls me in a panic. Guy, guy, my Tai Chi instructor just backed out for Sunday's cruise. Can you do it for me? Can you go on a cruise for a week and teach Tai Chi? You'll get a stateroom. You only have to do two classes a day, one in the morning, one in the evening, and the rest of your time is owned and will pay you. It sounded great. With one minor problem, I had never taught Tai Chi in my life, not even for a moment. I said, Ruthie, I've never taught Tai Chi. I can't do this. She says, Guy, you'll be fine. I need you. You can do this. I said, Ruthie, I can't. Tai Chi is an ancient discipline. I am dishonoring the people that teach Tai Chi by doing it. She said, Guy, you're doing it. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to go on the deck a couple of times a day, and you're going to go like this. You're going to call Tai Chi. They're going to love it. So who am I to fight? So I went on this cruise for a week, and twice a day I did my version of Tai Chi. It was kind of a version of Tai Chi meets step aerobics. And you know what? I got away with it. And not only did I get away with it, Ruthie calls me a couple of weeks later. We're getting emails from people. We're getting letters from people. They want to know when you're going to do another cruise. It was the best Tai Chi class they ever took. And I thought to myself, wow, my professor in grad school is right. Show them what you know, know more than they do, and you can get away with almost anything. And hopefully, with all due respect to those of you guys who are teaching Tai Chi by the book, with honor to the ancient, ancient discipline, that is my Tai Chi story. Okay. Um, as we mentioned, as we design our sports-inspired balance programs, they can be done anywhere, inside, outside, singly, or in groups. It's not appropriate for everyone. Know who your audience is. If it doesn't work, don't do it again. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Use your imagination. People, and I've taught variations of this workshop before, people always get bogged down in the rules. 
well, if we're playing volleyball, can the ball bounce? If we are playing golf, do they have to count every stroke? I would say use your imagination, but don't get bogged down by the rules. Um, I've got very, very few ground rules with my programs because what I have found too is if I don't have rules, my folks can't cheat. And what has been a revelation to me is that these wonderful, wonderful people that I love dearly, these saintly grandmas and grandpas, will cheat like thieves if they think they can get away with it. The only rule I've really got is laugh often, laugh loud. If you've got a background in volleyball or in golf or in soccer or whatever, feel free to bring in a more structured approach to the program. But remember, if we go back to our original premise of a strong component of play and fun, personally, I don't think there's a need to get bogged down by the rules. And finally, before we go into the curriculum, because um, remember, this is like part one of a two-part process tomorrow, tomorrow, morning, uh, tomorrow morning's class as well. Make sure that you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's. Complete the health history with your informed consent. And very important, have that emergency contact info just in case. The informed consent that my folks are signing right now for the city has also got a, um, a COVID clause in there as well. They realize that they are exercising and going maskless at their own risk. And if they, God forbid, should contract COVID, it is not the responsibility of the city or of any of the city employees or workers, okay? Um, you should minimally know the client's cardiovascular health. You know, some of these drills are a bit intense. Is their heart strong and healthy enough for it? You should know their medications. Are they on meds that are going to increase their fall risk, decrease their cognition? Um, you should know their orthopedic history. Do they have a bad back, a bad knee, a bad shoulder? Are they working with a new hip? Know what you are dealing with so you can offer modifications as appropriate. Things that I always, always have on hand when working with my seniors, if I've always got my blood pressure cuff there, always. You know, very often when somebody gets weak and dizzy, we're inclined to think maybe they're going hypoglycemic, but they could be going hypotensive as well. I always keep with me glucose tablets in case they are going hypoglycemic. And I've learned um, in the advice of a cardiovascular nurse, I keep, set, uh, I keep salty snacks in hand as well. Then in case they are having a bout of low blood pressure, sometimes a bit of salt and walking them around will raise the blood pressure back up. I've got my first aid kit back, back always with me. So things that you might want to consider to have just in case things head south. Okay, and now we're off. The first of the drills we're gonna take a look at is called hot potato goal. I'm not sure if this is actually a sport or not, but I'd like to start off with this because everyone, everyone has played hot potato. Whether they did it themselves in school, whether they have done it you know, with their kids or their grandkids, we have all played hot potato. So what we have here is just, this is just a playground ball from Target. We've got folks in a circle. Um, one variation is you've got one or two people in the middle of the circle, just throwing the ball to people at random. Another variation is nobody's in the middle, they're all in a circle, and they just throw the balls at random. You know, clearly, you know, having one or two balls is less intensive than having multiple balls, but the goal is catch the ball and get rid of it as quickly as possible. I don't think this needs a whole lot of explanation because as I mentioned, I'm sure we've all played hot potato. It's a good warm-up drill. It's a good ice breaking drill. Um, a nice thing to do is have your client call out somebody's name before they throw them the ball. So they might say, okay, Dan, here's your ball. Or George, you're up and, and do it that way. So hot potato is where we started. Okay. I had mentioned earlier about improvising, using your imagination, one of, the, one of the earlier slides had mentioned going on a scavenger hunt. You know, go through your basement, your attic, your storage shed, your garage, and see what you can find. One day I came to my class, not quite sure what I was gonna do with them, and they were just unpacking eight brand new cornhole boards. They had just bought them, different colors, all emblazoned with the city's logo. I ran to the Parks and Recreation Director's office 
I was like, Patrick, can I borrow those today? He was like, sure, go for it. That's what they're there for. And so very quickly, I was able to set up an entire um, cornhole routine for my folks, completely out of the blue, never expected it. My classes tend to be very large. I did not have enough of the beanbags to throw, but I had plenty of ping pong balls. So we improvised. We put a bucket of ping pong balls on each table. We had the folks line up, and the goal was to come up and throw a ping pong ball and try and get it through the hole. That's all there was to it. And the folks loved it. Some of them had heard about the game Cornhole from their grandkids. Some of them had seen it done like in bars or in special events. Most of them had never done it before. And they loved it. If you take a look at the floor, there are three type lines. There is a red line up close, a blue line in the middle, and another line further away. They were able to choose which line they wanted to pitch from. Obviously, the red line was the closest. The blue line was further away. So we played cornhole. They loved it. Uh, we had done it a couple more times. When all the balls in the ping pong or in the, in the bucket were gone, the next part of the drill, which is a classic weight shifting drill, was they all helped me to pick up the balls, put them back in the buckets, and we started again. It was completely unplanned, completely, completely improvised and spontaneous. And people were talking about this literally for weeks afterwards. So that was an example of, um, yes, absolutely a sports-inspired drill. I'm not sure if Cornell is really a sport or not. Is it really a sport if you can drink beer and eat nachos while you were doing it? But it worked out well and um, very popular, spontaneous, improvised drill. Dodgeball. Whenever I mention this, this raises eyebrows because I know that um, dodgeball in 2021 is politically incorrect. I know there's a level of aggression that can be seen in this. So rest assured, never fear, our version of dodgeball is not you know, trying to knock people out. We're not bowling for seniors. All we did, we've done this indoors and outdoors. This was a particularly lovely sp spring day took everyone outdoors to the park, stood in a big circle. I had three or four stability balls and all they were doing was rolling the balls across the circle with people. So there was really no dodging whatsoever. I called it dodgeball just because the older adults had a frame of reference for what it was. The balls were never airborne. We were not kicking, we were not throwing. Do you feel better now? Can you take a deep breath as your blood pressure going back down? Um, what I love about this drill is they had to do a, a hip hinge. So if, if the ball was in front of them, they hip hinged, wide stance, and using both arms, they flexed their shoulders forward to get the ball to roll. Because very few of them were strong enough to get the ball all the way across that circle, then what they had to do was they had to walk forward, get the ball, and do it again. So that was my version of senior dodgeball. It was really a weight change, a level change, a hip hinge, lots of core strength, and it, it was fun. It was just a good, good way to get outside and enjoy the pleasant South Florida spring weather. Bowling. You know, another activity that I guarantee you virtually all of your participants have had some reference with, if they have not done it themselves, they have seen it done. But you know, many of my folks were in bowling leagues at some point in their life. Many of them are still bowling on a, on a, regular, on a regular basis. So all that we're using here is we're not using bowling balls. We're not using pins. Remember guys, this is improvised. This is pretend bowling, okay? These are just playground balls. They are very lightweight balls. They look like med balls, but they are completely lightweight that I found at Target. Um, I love them. I have never been able to find them ever since. When I found them at Target, I bought out the entire store. I bought out like 10 at the same time. And I think I'm down to just six or seven that I've got left over and I guard them with my life. Anyway, so here's our options for bowling. Option A is they roll the ball like they're bowling it, they chase it, and they pick it up themselves. Option B, they roll the ball, somebody else chases it. 
options C, they roll it towards somebody who is walking towards them. In any case, I'm going to show you the video now. Roll video. Here we got Nancy rolling the ball, and now she is going to go chase it. There was somebody across from her. She's supposed to go chase it. I guess they're just rolling back and forth. So they're on to option C. They're rolling into somebody who's going to roll it back to them. See, Mary, Mary did a no-no. That ball bounced. So that's one variation of bowling. They're just rolling to somebody who will eventually roll the ball back to them. Now, other variations of this can be done on a tabletop. What you see here, and we're just using plastic cups because they're available. And you can see that throughout my room, I've got different stations where groups of like four or five people are bowling at a time. They're setting up their plastic cups as though it was a set of pins in a regular bowling alley. And what they're doing now is they're using a gliding disc or a tennis ball to roll them down or to, or to mow them down. All there is to it. A pretty conventional approach to bowling. Um, if they get a strike, those cups are all going to fall on the floor. And again, remember, part of the drill is bending down to pick them up. There's your level change, there's your weight shift, and putting them back on the table. So this is our variation of plastic cup or solo cup bowling. Another variation of the same theme is use your cups and build them into a tower. And then with your gliding disc or your tennis ball, try to knock as many down as you can. And again, bending down to pick them up off the floor is part of the drill. And, and guys, to me, this is very functional. If they live alone, if they're living independently, they have got to be able to bend, able to bend down and pick things up off the floor. You know, it's laundry day, a sock falls down, they're cooking dinner, and a chicken wing falls on the floor. They're not gonna leave it there. They have got to be able to hip hinge, do a modified deadlift to pick it up. So that is all a part and a parcel of the drill. So these are all variations of the bowling drills, either with the ball on the floor or the cups on a table. Now again, anticipating the questions before they come out. Whenever I have presented this, someone will say, well, in the place, the space where I am teaching, I don't have a table. And I would venture to say, you don't need one. You know, you can set up, you can set up the bowling pins with the cups on the floor. You know, you can make the towers on the floor. And from there, you can squat down with your, um, with your glider, with your tennis ball, or you can kick the glider as though it is, you know, gonna slide across. There's all kinds of ways that you can do this very, very effectively and still meet our goals of having fun and making it a very functional balanced activity. These are some of my very most popular drills and often the towers are very, very um, popular because the urge to construct, I think is strong, but the urge towards destruction can be, can be pretty strong as well. Okay, fetch, do I have a, yeah, I did not have a, um, a slide on this. Um, fetch is similar to bowling because what they're doing is they are chasing the ball that they have just thrown. I think I've got a video here. Yeah, I, I see what happened. The video's reversed. This is the senior bowling. Here we go. Nancy is bowling the ball and she is then chasing it. And now Kristen is bowling the ball and she is chasing it. And I think Kathy is next. She's rolling the ball, got kind of a hook there and chasing it. If this were fetch, they could also do it where they roll the ball and someone else chases it, okay? So fetch and bowling are both pretty, pretty closely aligned. I just, I just switched the videos, which I apologize. Okay, now let's move into miniature golf. Let's move into miniature golf. One of my most popular drills ever. My folks love miniature golf day. The equipment that we use is all done with PVC pipes that I buy at Home Depot. Oh, and by the way, guys, we're not gonna cover it, 
but in your handout at the very, very end of the presentation, I've got a complete shopping list for you, telling you what to buy, what sizes, where to get them, and how much they should cost. But I do this with PVC pipe, pipe like you would use for plumbing. Um, the Home Depot by me sells the PVC pipe already pre-cut in a 24 inch height or length. And that works out pretty well for most of my clients. You know, I'm very tall, so I've got to do a major hip hinge to use a 24 inch um, golf club, but it works for my clients. At the end of each club, you can see a piece of pipe fitting that is called a T. It just fits on there very snugly. And essentially when you're done, it looks like you've got a putter. We've got plastic cups and agility rings, which suffice as our holes. And we use ping pong balls or tennis balls as our golf balls. I prefer ping pong balls because they're more in the same shape as a golf ball. And what we've got here are just still photographs from one of our mini golf sessions where they've got their ping pong ball and their putter and they're trying to make or trying to get the ball either into the agility ring or the cup. We start off with the orange agility rings because those are pretty big holes and they are hard to miss. After we do some rounds with trying to get the ball into the agility ring, then we switch and we move it into the plastic cups, which is where we're about to switch momentarily. But there we go. For this one, generally they pair up and they try and get that ball into a plastic cup, nothing to it. They love this drill. Many of them are quite skillful at it. Um, it requires very, very minimal equipment. Many of the folks that you're taking a look at here in these photographs are well into their 80s and 90s. And again, to what I sometimes call a guaranteed crowd pleaser. Sandra just got a hole in one there, so she got a hug for that. It's a absolutely guaranteed crowd pleaser. Different variations of the miniature golf, if you wanna see the live action versions, is we've got Julie, holding the cup while Lynn is putting. Got another variation over here. Just trying to putt, get it back and forth into the cup. So very, very straightforward. And those are our variations for mini golf or putt-putt or whatever you want to call it. Okay. From miniature golf, we're going to switch into our version of senior table tennis. We would call it, in the real world, we would call it ping pong, but we don't for this presentation. You know why? I don't know if you're aware of it, but ping pong is a trademark term. The term ping pong is owned by the Parker Brothers Company. It was trademarked in 1901, and, and unless you were using authorized Parker Brothers manufactured or licensed ping pong equipment, we are really playing table tennis. Surprise? That ping pong, it's kind of like Kleenex. We all use it, but it's really a trademark term. I know that many of my older clients are very grateful that beer pong is not a trademark term because senior beer pong is very, very popular, but we're not gonna cover that. We're not gonna cover that in today's webinar. Okay, so for our version, of senior table tennis, we've got folks with ping pong, with table tennis panels on either side of the table. The table suffices as their net and the balloon suffices as their ping pong ball. So they're just volleying it back and forth. If you take a look, I like this as a vestibular challenge because they are always looking up to see where the balloon is. They are moving forwards and backwards so there's level of control there. All in all, it's another of those guaranteed crowd pleasers because it's fun. These folks were being very, very um, gentle, I think, as they knew they were being filmed. After a while, the gloves come off and they really start to smack that balloon around. So that's our variation of senior table tennis. You see that in the background, I've got a net there. That's the net that we use for indoor pickleball. 
you know, you could use that with a nut as well. And if you don't have a nut, if you don't have a table, just improvise. If you don't have ping pong paddles, you can just hit it back and forth with your hand as well. But that is our variation of senior table tennis. Okay. I don't know how many of you guys are involved with pickleball. It is all the rage down here in South Florida. The city of Wood Manors, where I work, um, over the quarantine, they converted a bunch of their basketball courts to pickleball courts because the population of Wood Manors is aging quickly and there's a huge demand for pickleball. Um, in many senior communities, senior environments, pickleball is now regarded as a must have amenity, the way shuffleboard was regarded a generation or two ago. If you've never played pickleball, it's a combination of tennis and badminton and table tennis. One of the hallmarks is it features a much, much, much smaller court than does tennis. Because the court is smaller, um, it's easier on aging joints because they're not running as far in different directions. It's a much more controllable court than is a full-size regulation tennis court. Um, for pickleball, they use like a, like a waffle ball. It's a small weighted ball with holes in it. So it's heavier than a badminton shuttlecock, but lighter than a tennis ball would be. Um, the racket is a kind of a, um, again, a hybrid between a um, handball or between a racquetball racket and a, um, and a ping pong panel, and much smaller than a tennis racket, and a much shorter handle than a badminton, badminton racket. Um, it's a great cardio activity. They can get their heart up. It's very social. And from what my folks are telling me, it's addictive. You know, they just cannot get enough of pickleball. So we had brought it in to the senior center and we did a version of indoor pickleball, which we have just gotten started with. Now, all four of the women who are playing right now have a history as tennis players. And the four of them frequently play tennis together. This was the first time they had ever tried using a pickleball racket and a pickleball ball. You know, obviously we're not playing to score. We're not playing with any kind of point system. We are not playing to win or to lose. The whole goal now was just to move around and to keep that ball in the air, try and volley. You know, as they go further, and the city does have a pickleball instructor, who is not me, who will be working with the folks, but this was just a taste of what pickleball was all about, to get a feel for it. The playing field that we are using here is way small, even by pickleboard standards. The two women on your left, Julie and Kathy, have a wall behind them. You can't quite see it, but the women on your right, the women on your right, Nancy and Lynn, have got a table behind them. I do this quite frequently with moving drills because my concern is if they start going backwards, they might not be able to decelerate and they might fall on their backside. So the bottom line is, on either side of the net, if they go backwards too fast or too far, they're going to literally hit the wall or hit the table, which is going to hopefully prevent them from falling down to their backside. So again, this is a totally improvised drill. Pickleball is a bona fide sport and just giving people a taste for it in keeping with our theme of sport-inspired drills. Okay, soccer. This one is um, a very special moment in the history of our brains and balance programs. You might recognize the gentleman in the background. That's my good friend and colleague, Paolo Andeleft. He is one of the presenters actually this weekend as well. Um, if you get a chance to see his, um, his webinars, he always does a really, really great job. Um, when I was on vacation in the Grand Tetons, as it turns out, the background behind me is the Grand Teton Mountains of Wyoming. Paolo and another colleague, Lou, took over my class for me. Now, Paolo has got a very strong athletic background, unlike me, and a very, very strong background in soccer, uh, again, unlike me. 
And what he did on this particular day was he did a mini soccer clinic for the older adults. They are talking about this years later. He is still just using the balls that I got at Target, but he was doing a variety of soccer inspired drills with the older adults. They were throwing, they were practicing headers, they were kicking, they were doing a wide variety of drills that was focusing on reaction time and on response time and on you know, thinking and moving simultaneously. The, you can see by the photographs, um, you know, how well it was received. People were still talking about this months later. Um, I think they're all secretly kind of hoping for me to go on vacation again so that Paolo and Luke can come back and they can go back to their soccer drills. So totally improvised, totally spontaneous, and again, keeping them in the idea of balance training plus fun plus functional. I really believe this ticks off all the boxes. And I am internally indebted to both Paolo and Lou for um, introducing these folks to, this, to these drills in this game. Here are variations of the soccer drills that I am comfortable with. What we've got over here is we've got Kathy. She's my class jock practicing headers. She's really not doing this over and over again. The video is just on a loop. But again, take a look at the balance and coordination. The, I guess you would call it this head eye um, skill that this requires to bounce that ball off the head. So that was a soccer inspired drill. Another soccer inspired drill is kicking. And all they do now is just go down the line and kick that ball across the room. There is somebody across the room from them who is catching the ball and is going to kick it right back. Again, I like this particular shot because you can see how the table is behind them, that if they were to kick with enough force, that it would shoot them backwards, that table is there to catch it. I don't know if you can see, but the very last woman on the, on the right, Mary. Mary is 92 or 93 years old. If I can stop this thing, you, you may have been able to see how she was hanging out of the table while she kicked. So we've got the good drill, again, taking off all the boxes of our balance program, but we have still got, in the back of our minds, the safety and the injury prevention and giving them support, vertical support, if they need it. And finally, going to our last drill for this webinar, shuffleboard. You know, and the idea of older adults playing shuffleboard in Florida is just such an incredible cliche. But like many cliches, there's enough truth to it to give it some kind of a credence. And I, I'm born and raised in Southern Florida. And when I was growing up, many of the homes in our neighborhood had poured concrete shuffleboard courts behind the house. You know, like, like now pools might, or now homes might have a swimming pool or a tennis racket, or tennis racket, tennis court. Back in the 60s, they had shuffleboard courts. Now, over on the right-hand side, you see a regulation size shuffleboard court. They're roughly six feet wide and roughly 10 feet from point to base. So when I was doing my shuffleboard, which I do on a regular basis with my folks, when I was making my indoor shuffleboard court, I make this out with masking tape and I make it to the dimensions of the regulation size court, about six feet wide at the base and 10 feet from point to base. Now, if you remember, or if you've ever played shuffleboard, or if not, they have a puck. They move the puck with a, um, with, with a stick, like a, like a hockey stick, and they are trying to get the most number of points they can. Obviously, if they can get the puck to that little triangle at the very tip, they get more points than if they go to the wider sections at the bottom. Generally, when playing shuffleboard, if I remember correctly, you had three or four different pucks, and you and your partner took turns, and you, the goal was to see how many points did you could get. So indoors, we play a little bit differently, and they only have one, one shuffleboard triangle. And if you take a look at the left-hand photograph, I usually have got my baseline 
about 12 feet away. Because we don't have pucks or sticks, we do this with furniture gliders and our feet. So it's kind of a version of kick shuffleboard, and it looks like this. Those, by the way, are furniture movers. I use furniture movers instead of gliding discs because they are way cheaper, well, way cheaper. I can get eight for $9.99 at Home Depot, and they glide very, very well. Those are just three inch furniture movers. Everyone is taking their turn behind the starting line, and they are kicking their disc towards the court. And the goal, of course, is to get students right on the outside. And the goal, of course, oh, I want to point it out. You see, Mary's going to kick, 93-year-old Mary. She's bringing Kathy over to hang on to for support and stability. You see that? That's how we make it very inclusive. And she actually did quite well. That's how we make it very inclusive for everyone. Kathy, by the way, is Mary's daughter. Anyway, where I was going with this is they kick and they try and get into the highest point value on the shuffleboard court. The table's there behind them just in case in case it hinges them backwards, and they are off. And that is our version of shuffleboard. If I had my regular size class of 30 or 40 people, I would have multiple masking tape or um, duct tape um, diagrams sort of throughout the course. I wanted to mention something about if you do this for yourself, I prefer duct tape. The duct tape is hard to get off the floor. If you use painter's tape, the painter's tape is easy to get off, but if anyone walks with the painter's tape and they are shuffling, they're gonna pull it up. And once that painter's tape tends to bunch up, it is a major, major tripping hazard. This duct tape is down, well, pretty much into the end of time, but I feel it is safer and it comes in good bright colors. So that is my version of indoor shuffleboard, which my folks love. And they get very competitive. We're gonna to talk tomorrow about the pros and cons of competition when we do our Olympic games. Okay. You can also sit on the table. And table shuffleboard is big business. Um, what I do is to keep the discs from rolling off the table, those pieces of pipe that look like a pool noodle, what they really are, it is um, plumbing insulation. The plumbing insulation is split down the middle, so I just put it on each side. And what that does is it keeps the disc from rolling off the table, and it saves you a lot of time from having to go and get the discs off of the floor. If you take a look at the right-hand photograph, there are three spots or three spaces on the table, number one, number two, number three. Um, and they all have a different point value. Number three is worth more points than number two or number one. Okay. Again, if you don't have the, if you don't have the table, just around the floor. But those um, insulating sleeves are great to keep things from rolling off the table. And here's what our tabletop shuffleboard looks like. So she was right in the line between two and three points. They just take their turns. When I have a large class, I will have multiple tables set up so no one has to wait. It moves quite quickly. They move their disc. Nancy just got a full three-pointer. She was happy. Now remember, those bumpers keep the disc rolling off the table, <laughs> except when they don't. The best laid plans often go awry. So that, my friends, is your tabletop shuffleboard. Again, another sports-inspired balance drill. Okay, and finally, leaving with a major crowd pleaser, Frisbee. Everyone knows what Frisbee is. We played it on the beach, we played it in the park, we played it in the, when we were young, we played it with our dogs. God, does my dog love Frisbee. Um, and here we're doing it with inner tubes. Here we're doing it with inner tubes. I've got the body bottom, because I specifically want you to hear what the old folks are doing they would play this game for hours. All they're doing is they're tossing their feet like a frisbee from one person to another. Got about six per table. Um, I guess those here. 
they've got about six per table. Just having a really good time. So that my friend is with me. I buy those liquor tubes at Target or Walmart or Publix for about 99 cents each. And another and the last of our sports inspired drills. Good job. Okay. That's what I've got for today. I'm going to open this back up to Dan for questions. Um, I'm going to zip through these. This is the shopping list. This is the very end of your um, handout. If you want to know what to buy, where to buy them, how much to pay. We talked earlier about how to get a copy of today's outline. The exercise is set on a Facebook page. I'll put this slide back up momentarily. You do not have to be or have a Facebook account to make this work. Our still photographs, courtesy of Susanna Newell, um, who spent an entire summer doing an internship down here, and she was gracious enough to give me access to her photographs. And of course, my models, who call themselves the, the Brainiacs. And that, my friends, is the end. So I'm going to turn this back over to Dan. Dan, we got through it with no thunderstorms, no lightning storms, no power outages. And if there are any questions, now is the time. And if not, thank you for your attention. I hope I'll see you tomorrow morning. I hope I'll see you in Denver in September. All right. I think I got my video turned back on there. Um, there you go. All right. Excellent job. That was great stuff. Um, I took several notes and got some good quotes. So uh, tomorrow you're doing part two and you're going to focus more on uh, Olympic style games. Is that right? Yep. Tomorrow is all things you might see in the Summer Olympics. Um, the, the decathlon, relay races, um, fencing, volleyball. I'm probably leaving something out. But all the stuff you, you'll see in the Tokyo Games in a couple of weeks. Great, great, great. Um, Lisa says, any ideas for classes virtually? Yeah, some of these things, actually during the pandemic, I was doing virtually. Um, there, there's a real, there's a real, real challenge there, Lisa. Um, it really depends on how much they can get on. But what I would do is I would say before class, like if we were doing bowling, you know, get ten paper cups, get a tennis ball, or get you know your dog's play ball, set them up, and just roll it and try and knock them back and forth. <clears throat> what I had some more success success with was doing a recording, like you saw and posting it onto YouTube and saying, you know what, do this on your own at home. Um, I had more luck with um, live virtual when I was doing my train the brain drills. Some of these do not lend themselves as well to virtual, but recording them, post them on YouTube, I found to be very effective. All right, what other questions we have for Guy? I think a couple people enjoyed your, uh, uh, Angela says, we were taught to be obedient. It's comfort zone that it's <laughs> to walk out of once in a while. Somebody else says, I try to keep telling them there are no rules. There are no rules in play. So, Well, Angela, uh, I went to Catholic school. I don't know your background, but having spent 12 years in Catholic school, I know about playing by the rules. It was yeah. tough for me to give up as well. <laughs> You got to know the rules so you know how to break them, right? So what there rules you go. Are you Absolutely. <laughs> Have you seen the uh, the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? Of course. Yeah, you remember in the the fight, he's like, "Well, what are the rules?" He's like, "There's no rules in a knife fight." <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, "Okay." I got by that quote, but I remember it now. Yeah. He's like, "Are you sure?" He's like, "All right, no rules." <laughs> Angela says, I almost had as much fun watching as they did playing. Sherry, as always, you present terrific group activities using innovative equipment um, at, and not innovative equipment, I would say, too, right? I mean, Guy is sort of the master of pl the plastic cups and ping pong balls. So, you know, two by fours and PVC, you know, all sorts of things that we can find. So Don't, don't forget my concrete blocks. Right, right. <laughs> uh those uh those magic bowling balls you sold out target and you haven't been able to find since so. yeah right <laughs> yeah i should have kept that secret to myself yeah yeah 
All right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys another minute or two for questions, but our end of the day announcement, uh, Functional Aging Summit day one is coming to an end. However, there are two more sessions uh, coming available, which are available now. If you go back to the page, there's a session with me uh, and another session with Guy. Um, so you have access to two more hours of content tonight, plus all the recorded sessions from this morning, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m. sessions. You probably haven't taken all of those in. So if you're on the West Coast or Mountain Time Zone and you're like, oh, man, I want two more hours, we've got it there for you. And then we resume again tomorrow at 7 a.m. with more recorded sessions until 10. And then 10 a.m., we kick off live with the keynote with Martin Pisani. Uh, and then we got live sessions following the same schedule as today, uh, 11.30, lunch Q&A at 12.30, 1.30, uh, 3 o'clock, and 4.30. And Guy, I know you're speaking again tomorrow, part two of today. So um, 11.30 Eastern time tomorrow morning. And Dan, I just put my email address up on the screen in case anyone wants to email me directly, feel free. Um, that's what I'm here for if you have any questions. Awesome. Awesome. And um, last reminder for everyone, uh, Guy and Exercise Etc. is doing uh, a live workshop September 18th in Denver. Um, we'll be out there with the Functional Aging Institute. We've got four workshops over two days, uh, live in person. Um, I mean, Guy's going to bring, bring all the fun and all kinds of stuff. So um, his is on Saturday, and uh, we have two workshops on Friday the day before as well. So make sure you're watching for that. Um, our, our topic this year is strength and conditioning for older adults. So it's not just balance, it's overall strength and conditioning. Um, for those of you guys who have been with me in the past, for brand new sessions, brand new continuing education numbers, they will be accepted by all, all of the major groups. And that's Denver in September. Be there. And uh, it's uh, you're just charging what 115 bucks? Um, it's 119. 119. Okay. 119. Yeah. I, I, knew, um, eight, I knew it was eight, a deal. Eight, eight, eight. Yeah. yeah, great deal eight, for eight, one eight, day. Eight. Yeah. Um, Nan is asking. Um, Nan, you have access to the pre-recorded sessions um, all all day, all night. So they're there on the page. Um, you can watch them anytime uh, this afternoon, this evening. They'll still be there again tomorrow. So. Uh, feel free to take a break and come on back. So we've got plenty of hours of content on the summit page. So, well, thanks everyone for making day one a great day. Um, we've had a lot of people in attendance in a lot of different rooms and guy, thanks for being here. Thanks for Thank sponsoring and thanks for all your content. We'll see you again tomorrow. Yeah, and thanks guys. Thanks for coming. And I hope to see you tomorrow. All Have right. See you everyone. Thanks Dan.